7 o'clock on a Sunday night, and you know what that means. It's Topical Starts right now. A very good evening to you, South Africa, those watching it around the world. My name is Blaine Herman, and this is It's Topical. The gang's all here. Our reporters fanned out across the United States of America as well as our digital audience. Our digital audience will come in soon. I'm interested to hear their burning questions for our guest in a short while. Well, the United States is regarded as one of South Africa's most valued trading, investment and development partners. The country heads to the polls this week. Millions of people have already cast their vote. Question, why should you care? The outcome of that election, what, what sort of bearing will, have, will it have on your life? Our aim tonight is to feed you food for thought, explore South Africa's relationship with the United States, and look at what difference will a Kamala Harris or a Donald Trump make in terms of South Africa and by extension, Africa at large. Which brings us to the umbrella question of the week. And we ask you, how do you envision South Africa-US relations should either Trump or Harris win the presidential elections. Let us know at SABC News underscore TV. Look, the American electoral system, it's a bit complicated, to say the least. Being the most popular doesn't cut it. It isn't enough. They use something called the electoral college system to decide their president every four years. Very different from the system we use here in South Africa. Now, the Electoral College, in simple terms, and I'll try to make it as simple as possible, is a process in which electors, or, or representatives, if you will, from each state, in number proportional to the state's population, cast their vote and determine who the president will be. See what I mean? It's a bit complicated, right? Now, there are over 500 electors, but the magic number is 270. Each elector casts one vote following the general election. So the candidate who gets more than half, hence the 270, wins. Now, this time around, it is between the current incumbent Vice President Kamala Harris and the former president, Donald Trump, right? As I said, millions of people have cast, in, cast their ballots already via mail-ins, etc. But what is the most viable path for both candidates to 270? We shall see. There are battlegrounds, battle states, swing states, Pennsylvania being one of them. Donald Trump currently in Pennsylvania speaking, trying to win the undecided possibly. Is there time? We shall see. Now, it goes back to 2020. Let's have a look at 2020. Joe Biden, Donald Trump. Now, many at that stage couldn't tell between the two in terms of who would go and win the, the White House. Now, as we know, Joe Biden winning by 306 electoral votes to Trump's 232. Trump, as you know, never really accepted the outcome of the elections, labeling it as fraudulent. But as we know, those results were certified and it stood. Let's go back to 2016. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Back then, pundits, commentators, no one gave, well, very few gave Donald Trump a chance. He ended up winning that election. It could have been historic. Hillary Clinton could have become the first female president in the United States. Kamala Harris could achieve that historic place in history. So we will see. Can she do it? Is there enough time? Remember, it was Joe Biden until a very short time. 100 days, is it enough to kind of figure out the potential voters that Harris has? Remember, it took, what, pollsters about eight years to pin down who Trump's voters are. So it's going to be very interesting. We have our reporters on the ground. We're going to get you the very latest as well as analysis. That and much, much more coming up. All right, let's uh, bring in SABC News correspondent Jagruti Dave. She's live for us in Washington, D.C. Jagruti, thanks for joining us. Give us a sense of how big of an undertaking is Election Day in America.
Well, Blaine, as you mentioned, uh, more than 70 million Americans have already voted in the US election through mail-in voting or early in-person voting at polling stations. But nonetheless, uh, election day itself is a huge undertaking with people voting across the country. Many people who haven't made their minds up or have decided that actually what they want to do is they want to vote in person on that day, on the first Tuesday of November, as it usually is every, every four years. And and, you know, famously in the United States, you have to register to vote. And also in some states, you have these long, long queues where it can take hours to get to the polling booth to cast your ballot. And this, as well as the issue of mail-in voting, if you remember in the last cycle, was one of the reasons, one of the uh, two, two of the reasons why Donald Trump and his supporters, supporters many of them were, them were citing, were irregularities in um, mail-in voting. And also some of the long votes, uh, some of the long lines are also pointing of contention for Democrats who, uh, you know, who say often disenfranchises many voters in many states where it takes a long time to get to vote and then the polling stations close and people don't get to cast their ballots. So yeah. this is a huge and complicated effort. And you've got the two candidates who are really campaigning up to the wire, going to those all important swing states to try to convince people who may not have made their mind up, who may not be considering going out and casting their ballot, that they should go and tick their names, either for Kamala Harris or for Donald Trump in this year's election. Uh, Jagruti, I saw reporting earlier this week of inflation cooling to the lowest levels in, what, three and a half years. I, I just want to get a sense in terms of the issues closest to the voters' hearts. Where does the economy rank? The economy, Blaine, is one of the top issues, possibly the top issue in voters' minds in this election. If you look um, at the cost of groceries and utilities in the last four years, they have gone up. And this is what is hurting consumers in the pocket, even though the economy is actually looking pretty good in the United States. It's one of the most flourishing economies in the Western world, according to lots of benchmarks. But yet people are not feeling it. And that's the issue that it's how people feel about the economy rather than the facts of how it's actually functioning that appear to be mattering. And it's really the post pandemic, the inflation soaring, the levels, the price levels went up so high. And whilst inflation has cooled, those levels really haven't come back down. So people are still paying more for things like fuel and groceries than they may have done pre pandemic. And yeah. so it's really hurting consumers in their pockets. And this is something that they are looking to, as they say, even though the economy appears to be doing better, you've got high housing prices. And if you look, the grocery prices have risen by 22% over the last four years, utilities and new homes have gone up by 26%. So these are, this is just to give you a flavor of how people are feeling about the economy and how much they feel that it's hurting them. Yeah. Look, in a race this, tie, uh, this tight, uh, the undecided could make or break a candidate's bid for the widest, right? Given the long lens of history, uh, do a lot of American voters leave it until the 11th hour to make up their minds? I think as we're seeing, you've got uh, 70 million people who've already voted. They've already made their mind up and they've already cast their ballots. In terms of percentages, according to Gallup, that's around 54% of, which is around half of registered voters who are saying that they intend, they've already voted or plan to vote before uh, November the 5th. And that is down from 2020, it was 64% in 2020. So fewer people are voting, fewer percentage of people are voting early before election day this year compared to four years ago. And as you say, it's those people in those seven crucial swing states, which include places like Pennsylvania, where Donald Trump is campaigning, Michigan, where Kamala Harris is campaigning, places like Wisconsin, those Arizona, those are the sorts of swing states where this election will be crucial, where it can make or break it for a candidate, as you say. But it's also those independent voters, people who don't cleave to a particular political party. They don't say, I am a diehard Democrat yeah. or I am a blood, you know, I, I am a ruby red um, a Republican. It is uh, people who are willing to change, shift their allegiances, depending on the candidates, depending on uh, the policies, depending on how they feel in that particular
particular moment. And they are really the people who could win it for mm. either candidate. And according to recent polls, um, both you know Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are pretty much even in how they are standing with independent voters. And so that is why you see both candidates really out there trying to make their case to minority voters. You've yeah. got Kamala Harris in Michigan going to a black church in Detroit, going to a barber shop, you know, really trying to court African Americans to get their vote, an indication of how crucial their yeah. vote is this time round, because it really they, they, their vote really made it for Joe Biden uh, four years ago. And Donald Trump is also cru cru courting minority voters. He's appealing to Muslim voters yeah. in Michigan, many of whom are uh, dissatisfied, disillusioned with the White House's approach to uh, conflict in the Middle East. Um, Latino voters, 30, 36 million eligible Latino voters whose uh, vote is cut, suddenly come up into, into the foreground here in this election. You know, it's always been there. Their, their vote has always been massively important. But of course, after the comments of that comedian at a yeah. Donald Trump rally in Madison Square Garden, um, where he called uh, Puerto Rico a floating island of garbage, yeah. he says in jest, but this was pounced on by Democrats. Um, as an indication of how Donald Trump and his supporters view minority voters. So these are the sorts of issues that could make or break in those last crucial days in the run-up to November the 5th. Yeah, it's an important point that SABC News correspondent Jagruti Dave, live for us in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much. All right, let's bring in Sherwin Bryce, is now live from uh, New York in the United States. Sherwin, good to have you on the program. What a week it's been, right? From what Jagruti was saying, that comedian calling Puerto Rico an island of garbage to Biden's alleged garbage comment. Has it made any material difference, though, Sherwin, in the minds of voters? What's, what's the latest polling telling us? Look, I think support for either candidate at this point is probably quite entrenched right now. So, you know, those slither of independent voters who maybe don't like Donald Trump's character, but like his policy on immigration or border control or see him as better on the economy. That's the toss up in their heads that they need to, you know, find a landing and a runway somewhere in terms of how they're making, the, how they're going to make their X in the ballot box. Yes, uh, it'll make a, a, an impact. You know, you criticize six million uh, eligible Puerto Rican voters that live in the mainland of the United States. So yes, in a swing state like Pennsylvania, where you have around 600,000 Puerto Ricans, that Puerto Ricans, that could have an impact uh, given just how closely the polls indicate that the swing state of Pennsylvania is. But here's something we don't often talk about in terms of these polls, Right, the, that, that show you a dead heat, that show you that this is going to be a race to the finish, that it's going to be a photo finish. It's it's always there's always a margin of error, Blaine, between 2.5 and 5 percent, and no one talks about what that margin of error can mean in a race that is so evenly split according to the polling. Does that that uh, margin of error favor a Donald Trump, or does it favor? A Kamala Harris. Let me tell you one poll that came out over the weekend from the Des Moines Register, done by a very respected pollster. They call it a gold standard. Now we haven't talked about the, the state of Iowa in terms of uh, you know in terms of the battleground states and the, and, and the swing states. She produced a, an outcome in a poll for the Des Moines Register in the state of Iowa that showed Kamala Harris leading Donald Trump by 47 points to 44 points, a three-point margin. The same poll in June demonstrated a four-point lead for Donald Trump. She has essentially overtaken Donald Trump in the state of Iowa that essentially leans Republicans has done so in the last two election cycles and literally has turned this conversation on its head in terms of those marginal voters in the middle that had, hadn't quite decided perhaps until now. And what the data in that polling is showing is that women, older women and independent women, in particular in the state of Iowa, are breaking for Harris in the, the last moments of this campaign. Mm. And what that could be demonstrative of is that this could be happening in other swing states, even where they show a very tight race in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in Nevada, in Arizona, yeah. North Carolina, Georgia, mention any swing state, it looks tight. But could women be, women mm. be a late breaking factor here in favor of Kamala Harris? That's the sentiment we are feeling on the ground right now. What is the woman's impact going to be? Yeah. Particularly, you know, you talked about the economy earlier, particularly on the question of abortion rights, access to abortion, reproductive rights, access to IVF, given that 2022 Supreme Court uh, judgment that overruled 50 years of precedent, uh, decimated the Roe v. Wade, uh, uh, access to abortion in, as a federal right in the United States. So 
the question of abortion is going to play an equally prominent role as much as the economy in this race. And right. let's see how the numbers look after Election Day. That's kind of where this game is. I was looking at Politico saying that it's taken pollsters, what, eight years to pin down Donald Trump's voters. Is 100 days really enough to accurately capture potential Harris voters? Fair question? It is a fair question. Uh, Donald Trump has had what they call the ghost voter, you know, people that don't want to respond to polls because maybe they don't like people knowing that they support Donald Trump. There's also a narrative that's emanating now in the closing days about uh, women in these Republican leaning states that don't want to tell their Republican husbands that they are probably going to vote for Kamala Harris. So people are not honest in the polls. The polls are a snapshot in time. They don't reflect the outcome of an election. It is speculative in nature. It is a prediction, a forecast. Just look at the weather guy. Sometimes they get it wrong too, similarly with pollsters. And so how these ghost voters break in these last, but the ones that you cannot tabulate, in addition to people that have not voted before. So pollsters don't have a history essentially with the 18 to 24 demographic, a surging young female voters, progressive young men yeah. who associate more with the democratic leaning progressive policies than they might with conservative Republican policies. How are they going to break in this election? Sometimes the polls don't pick up everyone. And yeah. so there are two scenarios playing itself out in the United States come election night. It's either going to be that the polls were so accurate that we're going to be, you know, pouring over the numbers days into this. Uh, you know, maybe Thursday we'll get a result, maybe Friday later this week, similar to what we saw in 2020. Or that margin of error favors one candidate in particular, and we have an early night on Tuesday night. Yeah. I wonder, though, this time around, Sherwin, before I let you go, are majority of voters swayed by issues or feel, uh, decency and democracy, or policy, or a bit of both? Excellent question, excellent question. Absolutely, they are swung uh, by emotions. Donald Trump is not out there touting his the details in minutia, details about his policies. He talks very broadly about, I'm gonna fix this, I'm the best one for that. In fact, he also says that he's leading in all the polls consistently, which is, of course, also not true. So Donald Trump is not very, he doesn't get into the details of his policy. So it cannot be that Donald Trump's policy is, you know, favored more than uh, Kamala Harris's policy uh, writ large, because he, he simply doesn't, you know, give people the details around those policies. So yes, it's very much an emotional attraction that Donald Trump has here. He has a legion of supporters that have supported him since through 2016, were heartbroken in 2020 when he lost and will show up in their numbers. The question really becomes whether those numbers are going to be enough for him. There is definitely an emotional uh, a, a driver here in terms of who will get to the polls. Yes, they wanted to know a lot about Kamala Harris's policy because she was this new entity that emerged after Biden's dramatic uh, you know, decision to step aside late in July after Donald Trump was, you know, a failed assassination attempt. There's been so much drama in this election. It's actually difficult for voters sometimes to focus on the policy persuasions of the diff different candidates. For some, it might be a bit of both, right? This is a very yeah. diverse electorate. Are you voting on the economy or are you voting on the economy and abortion or access to health care or immigration? So. You know, it's, it's difficult to answer that question, but there is definitely a, an emotional drive here, yeah. uh, certainly, but a lot of policy as well in between. Yes, correspondent show and Bryce Peace. Thank you, sir. All right, we are, have our eyes on a number of feeds. One of them was Donald Trump in Pennsylvania. Come walk with me while we get to more perspective from Sophie McQuenna. Pennsylvania is seen as key. I was listening to former senior advisor to Barack Obama, David Axelrod, saying that you win Pennsylvania, you win the election. Sophie, thank you very much indeed for your time. I want to just talk a bit about the candidates and their priorities. What do we know in terms of their focuses? I want to start with Kamala Harris. Her main focus mm. is the middle class and saying that she is going to empower the middle class. But secondly, saying that she is going to ensure justice and also the fair environment wow. in terms of uh, democracy as someone who was a prosecutor. And the issue of uh, international relations becomes a problem right. because you know that she has been supporting Biden mm. in terms of how he is handling the issue of Ukraine and pumping money into Ukraine, while Americans, some of them, don't approve that. In right. the Middle East, she is saying that there must be peace in the Middle East and the two-state solution. But 
America will always be America mm. and will always be behind Israel. Let's go to Donald Trump. Let me, on the continent, yeah. what we can expect is that she is a new person. And therefore, maybe the relationship will be different because she was not the head of state. Right. We go to Donald Trump, simple issue, making America great again, yep. the immigration, yeah. immigration, the economy, and America first. Mm. That's all about what people can expect from him. And he is not changing from yeah. his previous election campaign, particularly in 2016, where he was able to beat uh, Hillary Clinton yeah. because he was promising a better America. On the issue of foreign policy, with war in Russia and Ukraine, raging on in Ukraine, he has indicated that he is going to stop the war. Right. And today, Putin says he does believe him that he will stop the war. He has been very concerned about money that's been pumped into Ukraine war. And he is the man who doesn't like NATO. Right. Because he says NATO... The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, it's a burden to the fiscus of the United States of America as a main contributor. Yeah. On the Middle East question, he has already told the Prime Minister of Israel that if he gets elected, he wants that war to end even before he gets into that office that is January. Right. But he is still supporting Israel, but taking a bit of a stand to ensure that there's no war. And we know that where there were conflicts during his tenure, yes. he did uh, try to ensure that there are no conflicts. Right. And therefore he's pushing a ticket that I am going to offer you a peaceful world. Well, to international community. For Africa, yeah. I don't know whether we should just accept that his position previously of not really being interested right. in Africa will prevail. But hang on, the catch here, a Republican president always yeah. support all the programs that have been launched in terms of helping Africa. Right. PEPFA is a case in point. If he wins... He's likely to come to South Africa next year. South Africa takes over the presidency on the 1st of December in terms of G20. We're hosting the summit. What do you think that would be like, a Donald Trump coming to South Africa, given our relationship thus far? Well, I think it will be a big issue because, as I pointed out in his previous term, he had no interest in Africa. Mm even though he didn't do away with all the programs that were launched to assist Africa, including PEPFA, AGOA, and all of that. Right. But this time around, the G20 is quite critical because we are the incoming. Mm. And when we take over on the 1st of December as the G20 chair, the incoming will be the United States of America. And therefore, President Ramaphosa has to hand over the reins mm after the G20 next year, to an American president. So it will be interesting to see whether he will come. But let me tell you what I know about Trump, even before he became the president. Right. There was a time when he wanted to come to South Africa before he became a president, and he wanted to come on business trips. So maybe it will be easy for him to come this time around. And I think he might even respond to right. the criticism that he didn't take Africa serious. And times have changed. It's the scramble for Africa. Right. So South Africa has signaled their intention to apply for the two-term in terms of the United Nations uh, Security Council. There is the other question of the permanent seat uh, for two African countries. Which of these two do you think would be uh, batting for South Africa, so to speak? I'm not sure. If what we I do, do decide, know, yeah. I'm not sure. But what I do know is that Kamala Harris will bet for Africa. However, the catch here, she is going to continue with the foreign policy. And we've had already the ambassador of the United Nations, uh, of America at the United Nations, talking about two seats for Africa, but no veto power. Yeah. This one, he can just surprise people and say, with veto power. Yeah. But remember, he didn't really like money that was being pumped into 
uh, the United Nations. You know that he had a very frosty relationship with the world body. Mm. And therefore, I don't know what is he going to say, but he can go to the extreme. Right. Speaking about Donald Trump, as I said, he is in Pennsylvania, very key, looking to garner votes there. Are there any undecided? I still wonder about that. He is there live. Let's, let's try to dip in. Let's get a sense of what he's talking about, the final push before the elections. House Majority Leader Steve Scalise. Steve, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. And what a good man he is. He, he took some bad. I went to the hospital to see him the night he got shot. The doctor told me he had a 15% chance. He had almost no chance, and he lived. I actually think he's better looking today than he was before. It's true. I told him, I said, you know, you're a better looking guy today than you were. But he, uh, he's a great guy. He took a big hit, man. The doctor said he lost more blood than anybody that I've ever operated on or tried to save. And he said, I've been doing this for 25 years. And he lived. He lived because he's a strong person. Former Democrat, presidential candidate, somebody who's very popular, Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi? Thank you. Thank you, darling. Great. Great to And she just turned Republican. She just turned Republican. Governor Sarah Sanders, my friend, huh? Thank you, Sarah. Arkansas, she's doing a great job, doing a great job. A woman I have a lot of respect for. I've watched her for years. All right, Donald Trump, there in Pennsylvania, we understand Kamala Harris is in Michigan. Um, the other state that is key, obviously, Sophie, is Wisconsin. I, could it be the battle of the bases now? Yes, it is a battle of the basis uh, because it's quite important. But I think Pennsylvania, for me, is quite critical, mm. including Michigan. Michigan, I'll tell you, because of the conflict in the Middle East, that's where you have many people who are sympathetic yeah. to uh, Palestine. Mm. And therefore, it is quite critical. That is why you see... Uh, Kamala Harris going back there because you know that uh, many people are not happy about uh, the decision by Joe Biden, who is the president and she is the vice president, decision to support Israel and not really uh, punish Israel yeah. in terms of stopping those arms uh, supply and also the resources to Israel. And yeah. therefore, it is, for me, very, very important, including the black Americans who are there in terms of whether they will do as they did yeah. with uh, uh, Barack Obama. We saw them supporting again Joe Biden. Yes. But this time around, we don't know. And I think the 2016 taught me that the issue of gender is quite important in yes. terms of support from women. But there are women who are asking questions, perhaps, what did she do for us? But I think the issue of the uh, reproductive rights yeah. will assist her in that regard. But there are too many issues right. in the United States. Who, can you forget your homeboy? Uh, who? The man. Elon Musk. Oh, Elon Musk, <laughs> the homeboy. <laughs> well, he's throwing his weight. Uh, he's in some a bit of issues with regards to the money giveaway. We will see how that unfolds as well. But throwing his weight behind uh, Donald Trump as well. It's going to be interesting. We've got lots to discuss. We're going to break it down over the next couple of days. Very, all the aspects uh, that has to do with this elections, gender, education, key topics. Sophie Mokwena, SABC News International Editor. All right, let's carry on with our discussion. Lots to discuss. We bring in our guests, also our digital audience. Joining us tonight, Victor Homoswana, African business commentator, as well as Waldo Krugel, is a professor in economics at the Northwest University. Our digital audience will be popping up on your screen. Thank you very much indeed for your time, gentlemen. Uh, Victor, if I can maybe start with you. How would you describe, give us some context, how would you describe the current relationship between the United States and South Africa. Blaine, good evening and good evening to Waldo. I, I just like to always prefix everything I say. Donald Trump or Kamala Harris 
on the 5th of November will win the vote to become the president of the United States. Not of Africa, not of the African Union, not of South Africa. Yeah. The primary interest and the mandate that will keep them awake at night will be how to protect the American citizens, both in America and abroad, and how to protect the interests of America in a context that is favoring Brazil, Russia, yeah. India, China. By, by so saying, I'm, I'm talking about the BRICS, plus the new members like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, Egypt. That, to me, as a South African, is the issue I'm interested in. South Africa is a member of BRICS, and BRICS is leaning more and more to the countries that are keeping America awake at night. China will be the largest economy in no time. Russia, Brazil, India, those are the economies that are commanding the economy of the world. More billionaires and millionaires are coming out of those countries. Right. More trade is leaning towards those countries away from America. So its dominance, its, its days as a superpower are over. And I'm, I'm always interested in how any president, either of the two, will respond or react to the fact that America is no longer the superpower. I at least know what Donald Trump will do. He did it a few years ago when he took on China's phone maker, Huawei, yeah. and really forced Africans to choose sides because he was worried that Huawei was overtaking Apple, an American company. Mm -hmm. So I know that at all costs, Trump will protect the interests of America, and especially because of the economic ground that America is losing. So as an African, as a South African, I'm interested in intra-African right. trade, I'm interested in more power and leverage to the African countries. Therefore, I'm not sure that I want to be saying your excellency to <laughs> Donald Trump who called the continent. Uh, all kinds professor, of funny let me let me let me bring in professor um, US protectionist measures. Uh, Combine that with geopolitical tensions. What sort of risks do you think that poses for a country like South Africa? Good evening, Blaine, and good evening, Victor. Uh, those protectionist measures are unfortunately very likely to be inflationary in the U.S. Uh, and if that keeps their inflation rate higher, it prevents them from cutting interest rates the way we would like to see them cut mm. for us to follow those those interest rate cuts. So if, if they end up constraining their monetary space uh, in, in that sense, uh, it's also to our detriment in that it, it slows what should be a, a very positive cutting cycle for us. Um, I don't think we'll be directly influenced by, by their protectionist policies. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, our main interest is staying in the AGOA agreement. And, uh, again, uh, there it's difficult to tell. Uh, I suppose that a Harris presidency uh, will more likely stay the course and, and uh, f uh, follow the Biden uh, principles. Uh, with Trump, it's more difficult to tell. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that either way uh, they'll extend AGOA uh, for the for the next period. Give us a sense, Prof, in terms of how beneficial AGOA is for South Africa. It reduces the cost of our exports to the U.S. So whatever we're exporting, and it's it's mainly minerals and some manufactured products, they end up slightly cheaper in the U.S. than they would have been without the agreement. Uh, these differences are not big in, in percentage-wise. The the sort of tariffs that we face in the U.S. are low already. Uh, and there have been right. reports out saying uh, losing our spot in AGOA will not be the end of the world. Uh, but I think one should always consider that on aggregate, it may not be the end of the world. Uh, but in practice, there are businesses who are now exporting to the U.S. who will have to reconsider their export plans, who will have to spend money on, on finding different clients, uh, who are uh, sort of competing in markets uh, where those margins make a difference. Uh, so I'd rather be in the agreement and get the benefit uh, than be outside of it. Uh, we need it much more. Vic, so I'm going to come and get your, your take on that in a short yeah. while. We need to take a quick break. I just wonder, South Africa's insistence in terms of its non-alignment uh, stance, does it add more skepticism to countries like the United States? We'll find that out. We'll throw that to Victor in a short while. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching It's Topical, U.S. elections in sharp focus. We want to know, the lady behind you, if she comes to power, 
What will that mean for South Africa and Africa at large? If Donald Trump gets another bite at the cherry, what will that mean? You've had a, f a bit of a sense of what that could be, given he's a former president, right? But in real terms, what's your thoughts? Let us know at its topical, well, rather, it's at SABC News underscore TV. But we are opening up the lines. We want you to give us a call, please. The number will pop up on your screen. There you go, zero. 11714-0680-0681-0682. Give us a call. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Now, to our regular Word on the Street feature, we gather diverse insights on the U.S. elections and the potential impact on South Africa. This is what people had to say. Take a look. Obviously, it will affect a lot of things in South Africa. I mean... Import export is a big thing, but uh, yeah, I think it will. We'll see. It depends who wins. I think it's going to depend on the laws they'll be coming with, because at the moment, yes, South Africa is going through the worst state of their of their lives because of the government of national unity and the change of the ruling party and whatnot. But with them, I think we are going to suffer as we're already suffering, and we're going to suffer worse because. If they change the, the ruling party or the ruling president, they come with new laws. We need to adapt to their laws. It definitely will affect us because I know uh, the Americans are powerful in terms of economy. Whatever the decision that they make, they will affect the small countries like South Africa and Africa at the large. definitely think it is going to affect a lot of countries because a lot of countries uh, trade with the dollar. So, yeah, it's definitely going to, whoever comes in power, whether Kamala, it's Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, it's definitely going to affect countries economically. Joe Biden's administration has been a disaster in terms of foreign policy. What is happening in the Middle East now is a disaster, and I think uh, a win for Trump will be a relief for the people of Palestine, and, uh, yeah, it will stabilize the... the, the, the that particular region probably will have some um, effect, uh, direct and indirect, but in my view it won't have a big effect and we in South Africa mustn't worry about you know, what America is doing or what America's policies are. They're not going to change significantly as far as we're concerned and we must just get on with doing our thing here. We do appreciate your thoughts on that matter. Let's go back to our guest. Victor, I'm not sure if you heard the last speaker in that insert saying that they're not going to change much. Is that correct? Do you expect any fundamental changes in terms of uh, the United States approach or policies towards South Africa? Not, not at the moment, Blaine, because as I said, when you get elected as the American president, you worry about yeah. the interests of the Americans. But to say it wouldn't matter to South Africa is also not true because there are people whose businesses depend on yes. exports to the U.S. And to those people and their employees I would not, and their suppliers, I would not say it doesn't matter. America is still the largest economy in the world. But the question is, 300 million Americans or so versus 1.5, 1.6. So more than 3 billion in two countries alone, China and India. Yeah. You do the numbers. You add Brazil, you add Russia, you add Iran, you add Saudi Arabia, you add it. So I would say in the future, looking to the future, it's much more responsible and more, shall I say, better for your risk profile if right. you start doing business, not exporting raw commodities, of course, but exporting finished goods right. to the countries like India and China, because they are much bigger in size and volume does count. And let's not forget, Blaine, on the African continent, we have one country that's just as large as the United States. One country, Nigeria. Nigeria yeah. If you don't believe how Nigeria is, how important it is, ask MTN. Mm, mm, good point. Uh, uh, Prof. Aldo, you know, you heard the, the phrase, um, when America coughs, the world catches a cold. Given what Victor said in terms of the shifting geopolitical uh, state of play, does that still hold true, uh, given the current uh, situation around the world? 
I agree with Victor that, that these are trends, uh, but, but they're not outcomes yet. I think the Americans are still dominant in, in many ways. Uh, the way that uh, we are concerned about the Fed and their decisions about the interest rates, the strength or weakness of the dollar. Uh, on the economic side, they, they're a powerful force, and, and they are basically the only economy who's been growing over the, the last year or two, uh, compared to all the other major blocks who've been slowing. Uh, of course, uh, it, it looks different in China and India. There, a slowdown means growing at four or five percent, uh, which which we yeah. wouldn't consider a slowdown. Uh, but but the the Americans' model has been working well, and uh, I think they they are uh, they are uh, their influence may be waning in the longer term, mm, mm. Uh, but they are not done yet, and and it's it there's still a major market out there. Right. We asked our viewers to give us a call. Uh, you did. Well, I understand that we have Jeremiah on the line. Jeremiah, welcome to It's Topical. What's on your mind? And our speaker here, the, the studio also, Vishal, thank you very much. In terms of the economic policy, yes, we are looking at the new, new elected president. Uh, strategy will significantly influence the global economy, especially in South Africa. But when we are looking at uh, Trump, the uh, Trump victory can may lead to the increase of the traffic and more protections of the approach. Mm. But he, Harris can president is likely to maintain the status. But when we are looking at the foreign policy, the election outcome will shape U.S. foreign policy in terms of the, especially when we are focusing on the Middle East, where we, we see that Trump maybe can win the, the election. The Trump will president may lead the increase of tension to the uh, Iran, which yeah. is uh, Iran and other countries such as uh, Saudi Arabia. They are part of BRICS and our uh, South African our stand on this uh, on this war. Uh, but nevertheless, it's also we you know that uh, uh, BRICS now has uh, the country that they want to join. We want they want to even establish the. Uh, a, a, a currency for this. Right. But in terms of the in terms of the social justice, we are looking at the into this cardinal. Uh, uh, Harris is, is, uh, is looking at justice issues, including the racial equality and healthcare. So most uh, immigration. So uh, yeah, that is what it's right. my 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 chat analysis. Thank you very much, Jeremiah from Pretoria. Appreciate your thoughts on this matter, Victor. This partnership with South Africa's enthusiasm to partner with the likes of Russia, China uh, and Iran in the name of creating a more, what, multipolar world. How do you think that is viewed? Yes, I, I actually wanted to go back to that, Blaine. You mentioned non-alignment. Mm. I, I remember very well in the 80s, because that's when I was a teenager and adversity. I remember the non-aligned movement, which refused to go with either America or Russia, because they said we can't be getting involved in superpowers fighting over what we don't know, but that don't affect us. The non-aligned stance of South Africa to me is the best way to go in a geopolitically dynamic environment. There's a power shift from the West to the East, but it doesn't mean you throw out the US, you throw out yeah. UK, you throw out Europe, because those are still major trading partners and they have a lot of interest and many Africans are interested in those countries. But it's also folly to go out and in the name of protecting your relationship with NATO, throw out Russia and a China and a Brazil and an India that are obviously going to be the largest cities, the largest countries, the largest economies. So the non-aligned stance of South Africa to me is the best way to go. And I might not agree on everything with President Ramaphosa, but his stance on this is spot on because right. there's no business that South Africa has to be taking sides with sub superpowers or potential superpowers when those superpowers aren't having headaches about us. Uh, Prof, do you agree uh, the South Africa's insistence on this non-aligned stance, does it not engender more skepticism from countries like the United States? I suppose it could, but we haven't really seen much evidence of that in, in like last year's talks around the AGO agreement. Yeah. Uh, so, so there were some some fears uh, that that we may be stepping on toes, and uh, we had the Lady R incident mm -hmm. and all of that. Uh, uh, but but there hasn't been a lot of proof uh, of them souring towards us in in any significant way. And uh, I think the non-aligned game is a difficult one to play. But if you can get it right, it's a small country like South Africa it sh should try and do it.
We understand that we have another caller on the line. Let's take it. Uh, Mulatello is calling us. Uh, what's on your mind? Good evening, Blaine. Good evening to the U.S. as well and the panel as well. Um, so in terms of the U.S. elections, um, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, South Africa's alignment with BRICS, you know, and other partners, obviously, I think these elections will be significant in terms of when you also look at the global political landscape that's happening. There's a lot of democracies that are changing and, you know, new leaders are emerging. Mm. So in terms of South Africa, from our standpoint, is that um, we need to make sure that our agreements with our partners and our non-alignment stance remains as as it is. Because at the end of the day, if our you know, foreign policy is going to be solely based on one country's election outcomes. Yeah. And it leaves us also vulnerable to, you know, not getting the investment that we need to ensure that we grow our economy even further. Right. Well, Latello, thank you very much indeed for your comments. Victor, to what extent do you think South Africa and the United States interests, as well as values, overlap? Well, we went to the International Court of Justice and took a very definitive stance against Israeli's aggression, Israeli aggression against the people of Palestine, especially women yeah. and children. The U.S. continues to say Israel has the right to defend itself. We said NATO, well, we don't think Russia is the only aggressor in this because NATO itself is an aggressor by getting into the Ukrainian territory when NATO by its very nature was not supposed to do that. So I would say they talk democracy, but democracy that tends to be elitist, if you like, although South Africa, you can't say is pro-poor. I don't think we overlap much, quite honestly, Blaine, but trade relations still will reign supreme here. Right. And there are many South Africans who have interest in the U.S., and Af America still has an interest in South Africa because South Africa is the gateway to most of African economies. And because America would like the one billion plus South African consumers of its products, it would not want to, to sort of marginalize or antagonize South Africa that much. But as it, as it comes to values, I don't know. They protect American interests. We protect, sometimes don't know what. Right. Well, does, uh, Prof, does, does the U.S. have better options on the continent? Victor mentioned Nigeria. Um, wh wh what do you think? Those are tricky. I, I think there are many contenders who would put up their hand and say that they are the new gateway to Africa mm. and they, we can forget about South Africa. Uh, but, but none of those are straightforward. Uh, I, I think uh, in terms of just... Uh, the governance in terms of infrastructure, uh, in terms of accessing markets, uh, uh, we are still a, a very good uh, uh, spot uh, for, for entering into Africa. And uh, I think we shouldn't rest on, on, on those uh, laurels. Uh, but uh, yeah, to my mind, there's no straightforward replacement for them. Uh, which is why they keep on engaging with us. Uh, uh, we are we are almost like the America of African countries, a big economy that's that's uh, sophisticated and trend setting, uh, and and yeah. which cannot be ignored. All right, let's go back to our callers coming in thick and fast. Ricardo from Johannesburg. Very good evening to you. What's on your mind, Ricardo? Good evening. Yes, I'm just excited, anxious. Uh, getting more and more revved up and, I guess, fired up for a victory party. Victory party for who? <laughs> <laughs> that's the big question, right? That, that is the big question, right? That, yeah. That's the drum roll. That's the drum roll. <laughs> um, well, I'll give, you, I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. I'm from the Bay Area. Um, I celebrated a 60th birthday party uh, for uh, one of the candidates. And... Um, Oh, she's black, she's Indian, and she's beautiful. Right. And that's, and that's why I'm celebrating. <laughs> so a, a big thumbs up for Kamala Harris. It's historic, There's right? No doubt. The first female president of the United States of America. What would that mean for a country given the current, well, challenges that it's going through? I think we need 
empathy. I think we need someone who actually can lead and, and do more than just um, talk. And it's not even talk a good name. I just think, you know, there's been so much rhetoric that is not even relevant. There's been rhetoric that has been about campaigning um, kind of in the dark and, uh, and kind of aloof, whereas we have somebody that's got uh, real credentials behind her that understands kind of the challenges of the day. And a lot of those challenges that, you know, America faces are the challenges that we face right here in South Africa. And it's really about, you know, managing um, this aspect of leading in government um, and being a servant, being a servant to the people. Right. And she's demonstrated that, you know, time and time again with her role as prosecutor, her role as district attorney, as a senator, and even as a, as a madam vice president. So I think, you know, we need leadership. We need leadership, and we need it both strong and kind, not just, you know, a bully and not just someone who's going to be self-serving. Right. Um, given the fact, I just want to get one more point from your question to you, uh, given your relationship or your familiarity with Kamala Harris. Uh, South Africa taking over the presidency of G20 in December 1st, obviously focusing or putting a lot of the world's attention on confronting the challenges that Africa is going through, given that we're hosting the summit uh, next year. Um, what do you think Kamala Harris's approach towards Africa would be? Well, I think that there, there has to be a relationship, you know, with Africa but before you start talking about leading Africa. Yeah. And that relationship goes beyond just the continent. It's, you know, being familiar with the African diaspora, uh, which she is. And, you know, having that background, as I mentioned at the top of the conversation, of being, you know, both a black American as well as an Indian American, um, she has the, the familiarity and the understanding in her um, repertoire of how to manage first world and third world and how to manage um, a continent that a lot of times from America's point of view, you know, hasn't been a priority. And I think that this is where, you know, here's an opportunity once again um, to, you know, work through policies and work through um, um, diplomatic relations that put, you know, Africa, you know, as a priority. And I see Kamala Harris you know, in her leadership style, uh, yeah. making sure that where there's an advantage and where there's an opportunity uh, to make the relationships, you know, a better and stronger for the world, I think that there'll be support. All right, Ricardo, thank you very much indeed. Appreciate your insights on the moment. Uh, Prof, let's get some final words in terms of how you see this all developing. Obviously, as Victor said, the priority for the pre incoming president would be to sort out America first. How long can we see any, if not, you know, any changes, tangible changes uh, in terms of approach to Africa, in terms of approach to South Africa? I think it's going to take some time. Uh, it, it, it's not going to be quick. Uh, they've they've got a whole, almost a culture war to fight amongst yeah. themselves uh, and a lot of other things to do. Uh, and no, neither of the candidates have really indicated a, a lot of differences in policy when it comes to South Africa and Africa. So I think for the, for the well, to start off, uh, we'll see more of the same. And, but luckily, I think uh, our heading up the G20 next year is, is going to put us on that radar yeah. uh, and, and maybe uh, get something going there that would otherwise not have happened. Victor, final word to you. Yeah, exactly. You know, diplomacy, international diplomacy, if you're heading a country, a powerful country like the U.S., those things are important. So I would feel a lot more comfortable with somebody who at least pretends to understand the importance of diplomacy. <laughs> and if, if we're in the G20, I'm sure we will be a lot more comfortable with somebody who's not a hillbilly that's going to be calling us all kinds of names. But I repeat what I said. They will not get to the White House and say, oh, what about that country, South Africa? Right. But we're in BRICS. We're in G20. How long, you said, to ask him, Prof, is going to take before we see the change? It's going to require Africans to start wanting to be taken seriously, yeah. being more assertive. Nobody's going to take us seriously, more seriously than we take ourselves. So being in BRICS, being in G20 should mean that we are a lot more assertive yeah. about our interests or over our interests. And maybe the world will take us seriously. 
Victor Homoswana, Africa business commentator. Waldo Krugel is a professor of economics at the Northwest University. Value added, no doubt. We're going to rely on your better minds in the next couple of days as well to get fresh perspective. Appreciate it, though. Thank you so much. All right. We appreciate your thoughts as well, calling us. It's value added. It adds to the context of what we're talking about. Why should you care? Uh, and that's going to be important as we flesh out over the next couple of days. All right, before we go, here's my take. As a citizen of this country, do you value South Africa's relationship with the United States? Depends on who you ask, right? And the answer will depend on what you see and how you interpret it. The United States is seen as a valued trading, investment and development partner. During the SAUS Interactive Business Chamber uh, Forum in September, I think it was, yes, September this year, President Ramaphosa said that last year, the United States was the second largest destination for South Africa's imports, with bilateral trade totaling over $17 billion, right? Uh, Llewellyn, put up the graphic, give you a sense of what I'm talking about here. Between 2019 and 2023, total exports to the U.S. accounted for 8% of all South African exports, whilst under the African Growth and Opportunity Act and the U.S. Trade Preference Program, such as the, the generalized system of preferences, South African exports to the United States accounted for 25% of South Africa's global exports. But, as you heard, there were a few contentious geopolitical issues, right? The Russia-Ukraine conflict, the current situation in Gaza, and who can forget the docking of that Russian ship in Simonstown two years ago? How do these issues shape your perception of the United States and the need for South Africa to continue to pursue a sound relationship. And what will a Trump or Harris presidency mean for this country and its citizens? For me, the answer to the former question would lie along these lines, as long as it's mutu mutually respectful relationship, right? That's gonna be key. That aligns with South Africa's national priorities. And as for the latter, well, as with many things in life, time will tell. And that's my take. Democracy 30 up next with Oliver Dixon. Until next week, my brothers and sisters. Take care. Bye-bye.